Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. We come today to the end of this series on union with Christ. We began this back on March the 8th, it's a little longer than I thought it was actually, but we started back then looking at the union with Christ in light of the resurrection, what I thought was going to be a five sermon series leading up to Easter and preaching on the resurrection on Easter that just kind of kept growing and stayed in that and and ended up in Romans chapter 8 looking at union with Christ in light of what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8. We've also looked at Romans chapter 6 and Ephesians chapter 2 and Philippians chapter 3 and and other statements that the Apostle Paul made about union with Christ. One of the things that became clearly obvious throughout this study, I hope to you, is that the concept that the believer is is in union with Christ is literally everywhere, especially in the epistles. The concept that when we are in Christ and Christ is in us, that's the essence of the new life. That's the essence of salvation, is that union with, that, that intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's important to understand. The Apostle Paul, in this passage this morning, we're going to read. It's the longest passage we've read for any of these sermons. But it's the last verses, verses 31 through 39 of Romans chapter 8, where Paul kind of draws it all together, what he's been talking about in the first 30 verses of this chapter and other places also. But hear the word of the Lord this morning as we read from Romans chapter 8, beginning verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not now also uh, with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us who will separate us from the love of Christ will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword then he quotes from Psalm 44:22 just as it is written for your sake we are being put to death all day long we were considered as sheep to be slaughtered but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now Paul in that passage asks five questions. Perhaps you might see them as rhetorical questions. He's anticipating the answer that he's going to give us, and he he understands that he's asking questions that in many ways will blow our mind if we really and truly understand what they are. But they're they're, they're five questions that relate back to eight truths that that Paul has already told us about in this eighth chapter. Just by way of review, just quickly to remember, Paul has told us that for all who are in union with Christ, there are eight very glorious truths in these first 30 verses. He first of all wants us to remember that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's verse 1. He said that with the strongest affirmation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is, you will never stand condemned if you're in Christ. That, that, is a, that is a glorious truth. If I had one verse out of all the Bible, I think I'd like to put to memory as a believer and, and refer to over and over again, it'd be that first verse. Because Paul has said, I want you to know this, believer. If you're in Christ, you are not now and you never will be ever again under condemnation. The second thing he told us was in verse 3, he said, God did for us what the law couldn't do. In other words, what the law couldn't do, weak as it was, because of the flesh, God did, Paul says. He said, God did it by sending his son in the flesh to be a sacrifice, to be a substitute, 
in our place. Paul said, I want you to understand, the law was given to show you not how to be right with God, but the law was given to show you that there was no way you could ever possibly be right with God in your own strength. The law was given to show you what you cannot do. These are the perfections of God that are encapsulated in ten laws, ten words, but those are things you cannot in your own strength do. But here's the good news. What you couldn't do by obeying the law, God did in Christ Jesus, His Son, for those who are in Christ. Third thing Paul made clear was that if you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Verses 4 and verses 11 and, and following verse 11, he talks about it even more. But in 4 and 11, he specifically says that if you are in Christ, you have the Spirit of God living within you. You have the Holy Spirit as your strength. You have the Holy Spirit as the energy, the, the dynamite, the dynamos that is within you. He said, I want you to understand, you have the Spirit in you if you are in Christ. We talked about how that spirit brings conviction and convicts of sin, convicts of of righteousness. He's always at work in the believer. But the greatest thing he's convicting you of if you are in Christ, that you are in Christ. And he's reminding you of that. Fourth thing Paul says in verse 5 is that as a believer, as one who is in Christ, the Spirit of God has marked us out with a new and spiritual mentality. We think differently. We, 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 have a, we have the mind of Christ within us, Paul says in the Philippian letter. He said, I want you to understand this. When the Spirit was in you, within you, you put your mind on spiritual things, on heavenly things. You look to Him, and He helps you think rightly. You'll think differently as a believer if you're in Christ. Fifth thing he's done, he's taken away the dread, our dread of God and draws our hearts to God with a sense of fatherly goodness. He shows us that we are not only in Christ, but we are adopted into the family of God. We had no right to be. We had no standing to be, be able to say we deserve this. He said, no, he has adopted you with a spirit of adoption so you not have a spirit of fear or a spirit of slavery again. He is our father. In verses 16 through 19 is the sixth thing he shows us, and that is that the whole creation is longing and groaning to be made right, and someday, because of his coming again, someday there will be a right thing, everything will be set right in right order. And, and as a matter of fact, in that day we will see our, our, the glories of our redemption, the fullness of our being in Christ, the fullness of our being adopted into his family. And everything, all of creation will be set in order. Seventh thing he shows us is that the life in Christ is going to be a difficult walk. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy walk. There, there will be sicknesses. There will be struggles. There will be people against us. There will be all sorts of things going on. But in this oneness in Christ, in this union with Christ, he is always at work for good in the middle of all that for our good. Verse 28, for we know that, all, that God works all things together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. He's taking even the, the tragic things of life for those who are in Christ, and he's shaping those and making them into good in our life because that goodness is ultimately conforming us to the image of Jesus, to the image of his Son. And then finally, last week, we saw in verses 29 and 30 that the loving purpose of God will infallibly bring us into our eternal glorification. That God has been at work in the past. He is at, even before creation began, even before you are a thought at any point on the face of the earth, uh, even working now to conform you to the image of Christ and ultimately will take you into glorification. He uses the past tense there. We who are in Christ have been glorified. It's so certain. So God is lovingly working out his purposes to bring us to our eternal glorification. Paul says, I want you to understand that's the truth on which union with Christ is built. Then in verses 31 through 39 that we're looking at today, he asks these five questions. And he starts out by simply saying in verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? What are we going to say about this? How are we going to look at this? If all of this is true, and it is, if all of this is what we have in Christ, and we do, 
What do we say to it? Well, we, we say to it, uh, glory. <laughs> we say to it, hallelujah. We say to it, thank you, Lord. But, but Paul says, I want to answer that by giving you five questions that will help you focus a little bit on what it means. And what Paul has given us here is the attitude of the Christian who knows the truth of verses 1 through 30. This is the attitude of the person who really has staked their lives on the truth of what union with Christ is all about. This is the attitude of the person who says, I know that I'm in Christ, and I know I still struggle, and I know I still have suffering, but I know that it's not up to me. I know that it's in His hands. I know that He is the sovereign God who is taking all things and working all things together for good, for His, for His glory and for our good. So he asked five questions. What shall we say to these things? What, how are we going to respond to this glorious truth that has been given us by the Holy Spirit? And he asks these five questions. He starts out by saying, if God is for us, who is against us? Or who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now notice carefully, he doesn't start out just by saying, who is against us? Or, or who can be against us? We can answer that with a multitude of, of matters. I mean, we could, we could look and say, well, Satan's certainly against us. We could say, well, well, culture is against us today. I mean, there are people who are against us at every point. I mean, I, I was amazed this week again that the Freedom From Religion Foundation has raised its head again and is demanding that, that schools like Auburn and Clemson and Alabama and South Carolina and, and Georgia, I mean, all these in the Bible Belt, that they remove chaplains from their teams. No more, no more chaplains. You, you, why, there are people out there who are coming to know Christ, they said, because of these chaplains. We've got to put a stop to that. I mean, certainly there are people against us. But Paul didn't say uh, who is against us or who can be against us. Any number of things can be against us. But Paul prefaces that by saying, if God is for us, then who is against us? If God is for us, all of these other things will, will really mean absolutely nothing. If the God who has purposed our, our good and His glory is all-powerful, then why are we afraid of any opposition at all? What Paul wants us to see there is in light of being in union with Christ, we have the resources of Almighty God at our disposal and even living within us, so why should we fear anybody? Or anything. If God is for us, who is against us? Second question he asks is, is, is simply this. If he who didn't spare his own son, how will he not now also give us all things? All good things. All things that we need. You know, God who has purposed our glory and our good and his glory is willing to give up his own precious possession, his only son. If he's willing to do that, and he did... Why are we going to worry about our needs? Surely he cares more about us than he does grass in the fields and, and birds in the air. Yet Jesus said, listen, don't you know that, the, 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 that God is aware of all of those things and he knows all that and he provides for their needs and you're so much more important to, to him than those things are? And if he cares for those, he's going to care for you? So, so Paul simply says, listen. He gave his own son. He didn't spare his own son. Don't you know he will give us all things that we need? Why are we worrying about our needs? Paul said in Philippians, to the letter to the Philippians, he said, listen, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. But in all things, take your needs, your supplications, those things that you need, take them to God. Take them in prayer. Go before your Father, who loves you more than you can ever fully comprehend. Take your needs to Him. Somebody asked me last week, Bill, is worry a sin? And my answer was, absolutely, worry is a sin. Not an unforgivable sin, thank goodness, but it's a sin. Why is it a sin? Well, first of all, worry kind of denies what God is promising right here. Worry looks at God and says, God, you're not telling me the truth. God, I can't trust you. I can't believe you. You said you love me so much that you gave your son, and by giving your son, you're going to meet all my needs that I have. But, but Lord, I'm worrying about this, and I'm worrying about that. How can I be certain? Well, sure, 
it's a sin because it's turning all the attention back to yourself. When we worry, we're typically trying to say, how can I figure out how I can handle this? When in reality, just like with the law, you can't handle it. Only he can. God who did not spare his only son has given us, will give us all things that we need. This third question is one of my favorites. It's, it's found there in verse 33 when, when Paul simply says, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who will bring a charge against God's elect, God's people, God's adopted family? Who is going to bring a charge against them? Well, i got to tell you, charges are being brought against you all the time by Satan. You know, you look back at Job in the Old Testament. And you find there Satan coming before God and, and making an accusation about Job. Why he, yeah, certainly he follows you because you're good to him. You, take, you look at all the wealth you've given him. Look at all the family you've given him. Look at all the crops you've given him and the flocks you've given him. Sure, he's going to serve you, but you know, if you took all that away, he would curse you. He would hate you. He's not really what you think he is, God. You know, and, and Satan is still accusing Satan accuses us in our conscience. Satan comes to us and says, hey, you know, you're not, you, you got to see this thing. Maybe, maybe God's not telling you the full truth. Maybe, maybe you can't really trust God. Matter of fact, Satan accuses us generally in one of two ways. You, you've probably sensed this before. If you're, if you're in Christ, I know you have. There are two ways. One way he'll do it is this way. He takes two totally opposite approaches. Sometimes Satan will come to us and say, you are no good. Look what you've done. You're just no good. You know, you, you committed that sin, and how could a Christian do that? Why, you're no good. Or he will come to you and say, you know, you're great. Why, you're a, you're a spiritual person. You're, you're doing all right. You don't need to trust God. You can do it on your own. You're, you're doing a great job. You're great. Look what you've done. In both of those situations, there is the temptation to disbelieve Christ, disbelieve God. Both of those are accusations against someone who is in Christ. You know what our response has to be to that? <laughs> You're right. I am no good. You're wrong. I'm great. But I don't look to myself. No, our response should be no. I don't look what I've done, either good or bad. I look to what Christ has done. I look to the sacrifice that he has made and the gifts that he has given me in, his, in, in redemption. I look to these great truths of being in union with Christ, what that brings. No, I'm not going to look at what I've done. I'm going to look at what he's done because he is forgiven. If, God, if the God who has purposed our glory has declared us righteous, then why do we feel so guilty and so unforgiven so often? It's because we just aren't believing the truth of the gospel, the truth of what he said. There's a fourth question Paul asks in, in verse 34. He says, okay, then who is the one who condemns? Who is the one who condemns? And, and I've already kind of answered that. Satan's the one who's condemning. Sometimes our friends will condemn. You ever notice that? Sometimes our friends will condemn in order to hopefully look a little better themselves. You know, they'll say, well, I'll tell you what, I don't do that. Well, well, well look at you. You're, you claim to be a believer, and, and yet I'm not, doing, I'm not having the attitudes you're having. I'm not, having the, I'm not even doing the things you're doing sometimes. Why, why you say you're a Christian, and, and I'm not a Christian, but my life looks almost as good or maybe better than yours. I mean, sometimes even our friends will condemn. Of course, behind that is always Satan trying to bring the accusation. Trying to, he's a great accuser. You know that. So Paul said, who's the one who condemns? Well, we could answer that with a lot of things, but he immediately says, whoever it is condemns, it doesn't matter. Who is the one who condemns? Here's the key. Jesus Christ is he who died, yes, who rather was raised, and who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. If you're in Christ, he's died for your sins that they might be forgiven, all sins. That's what it means to be justified. 
It's what Paul meant in, in chapter 6 when we talked about that, that you have been declared righteous by God, the judge of the universe. You've been declared righteous. No, you're not sinless and you're not sin free and you have to deal with those sins regularly. But in God's eyes, you're forgiven. You have eternal life, not temporal life, not life that comes and goes, not life that's at the, at the danger of being snapped out because of your whims or your sins. No. If you're in Christ, it, it, Satan can bring charges, others can bring charges, but he wants you to understand that the one who lived the perfect life and died the perfect death is standing before the Father on your behalf if you are in him and he is pleading your case. He is your advocate. He is interceding for you. He's the best advocate anybody could have. We have advocates in this life, lawyers. And we, you know, we, we need them sometimes to plead our case. And sometimes they'll do a good job and sometimes they won't do such a good job. But that's the issue we need to see is that we have an advocate. We have a lawyer, if you will, that stands at the right hand of the Father. And he is perfect in all that he does. And he's interceding for you and me with the Father, just, just reminding us even that we are in him. Who condemns? Doesn't matter. Christ died. Perfect death, perfect life. He died on our behalf. Then the fifth question he asks is just this, verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? And, and, and the rest of these verses all he's doing is he's answering that one question and he's answering it boldly and he's answering it loudly because the last question, who will separate us from the love of Christ, is really in one sense uh, sort of all the other questions in one. It's kind of the summation question, if you will. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Because that's the only thing we really have to be concerned about. The only thing we really have to fear, if you will, is that somehow, some way, we might be separated from the love of Christ in this life. That's the central question of the Christian life. It's the one that prompts us to doubts and worries. It's the one that prompts us to not believe God. It's this, is there anyone or anything that can separate me from Christ's love? And, and Paul takes up the rest of this, this chapter, as we've broken it down, and says, it, let me use my Alabama vernacular here, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? He says, well, tribulation, that's hard times or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword? And, and his anticipated answer is, no, none of those things. All of those things are difficult. All of those things are bad. All of those things will cause us to struggle. But understand this, there is none of those things, no tribulation, no distress, no persecution, no famine, no nakedness, no peril, uh, peril no sword separate us from the love of Christ they kill you okay by the sword okay Paul says to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord for those who are in Christ Paul said to the Philippian Christian it's better for me for me it's better to just die and go on and be with the Lord but it's better for you that I stay here and minister to you but but Paul says listen there's no there's no separation from the love of Christ even by the sword even by death so they can't take it away from you while you're alive and they can't take it away from you if you die if they kill you because the love of Christ is secure it's the central question he goes on and says you know we as as believers we have, as those who are in Christ uh, it's written in the Psalms. The, the psalmist spoke of it. You know, for your sake, Lord, for the sake of Christ, we're being put to death all day long. You say, well, that's not happening to us. No, not here. But your brothers and sisters in Iraq, your brothers and sisters in Syria, a part of your family in the Middle East, are being put to death every day. Why? Because of their faith in Christ, for the sake of Christ. Pastor Saeed is sitting in a prison in, in Iran. Why is he there? He hasn't broken any criminal laws. He's there because of his faith in Christ. He, he's there because he will not deny 
Christ. He's in a horrible situation. But it's not separating him from the love of Christ. If you've had the privilege of reading the letters that he's gotten out of that jail to his family, the love of Christ is shining great in his life. And he's sharing the gospel with criminals there that are with him. And many are coming to know Christ in an Iranian prison because he's there. It's not good that he's there. He would rather be in Idaho with his wife and children. He'd rather be out of that dirty, filthy prison being beaten and being denied medical care. I mean, it's not good, folks. But it doesn't separate him from the love of Christ. And when those Christians were lined up on that beach and, and the, the beheaders came behind them with a sword and, and cut their heads off because of their faith, it was glorious that, they, that, that ISIS didn't have sense enough to cut the audio on the, on the filming they did it. And as they were having their heads cut off, they were praising the Lord Jesus Christ. Even having your head severed by the sword does not separate from the love of Christ. We're being put to death all day long for your sake. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But it's all for your sake and all for your glory, Lord. Then he says, understand this. Not only will those things not separate us from the love of Christ, but in all these things, in, in peril, in tribulation, in distress, in persecution, in beheading, in pri imprisonment, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Sometimes we have a trouble conquering when somebody laughs at us. When somebody says, I don't want to hear about your faith. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. We don't act like a conqueror. We don't act like we're victorious, but that's what Paul says we are. No matter what comes our way. Now, I love this verse 38 and 39 when he just goes into that. He just expands on verse 35 and he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, that could be demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wow. I mean, I think Paul in verses 38 and 39 is trying to think of everything possible that anybody might throw at him to say, this could separate us from the love of Christ. So he starts out again by saying, death won't do it? Well, no, but in this life, there may be temptations. There may be, there may be things that pull us away and separate us from, Christ, from the love of Christ. Paul says, no, not death, not life. Angels aren't going to separate you from the love of Christ as though they would want to. Nor will principalities, demons, principalities of this world. Nor anything that's here now or anything that's yet to come, nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, Paul is simply saying it ain't going to happen if you are in Christ. Not if you're just moderately religious. Not if you're just nominally religious. Oh, there's a lot that will separate you if that's the case. A lot that will strip it away if that's the case. But not if you're in Christ. Not if Christ by His Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. Nothing. Absolutely nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. So what is Paul saying here? Here's what I think he's saying. One word. Write this down. This is what he's saying to you and me today. He's saying, think. Think about what God's Word tells you. Use your mind. Use your brain. Think. Think. 
about what God is saying. You see, our problem is we tend to operate by feelings, don't we? Be honest. I just don't feel like it. I just don't, I just don't feel the love of Christ. I just, don't, I just don't feel the power of the Holy Spirit within me. Paul says it's not about feelings. It's about knowing. It's about knowing the, the wisdom and the knowledge of God. It's about knowing Him intimately. It's about being in Christ. So he says, quit thinking about, quit operating by your feelings and operate by thinking about what God has said in His Word because your feelings will lie to you every time. They will. And your feelings are where Satan can get in and kind of manipulate and strangle and, and draw you away. It's those feelings that are are devastating because we don't think about what Christ has said in his word. So I think what Paul is saying here is, are you afraid? Are you fearful? Now, I'm not talking about the fear of God here. Let's separate that out. Realize the scripture says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, it's the beginning of knowledge, standing in awe of him, recognizing who he is, worshiping him as he deserves to be worshipped. That's, that's off here in another category. The fear of God is not what we're talking about here. But being afraid of others? Being afraid of the future? Being afraid that, that your family's not going the way you want it to go? Being afraid that, that you know people around you might think less of you if they know that you really are a Christian and you're really sold out and commit. Are, are you afraid? Then, then Paul says you're not thinking. Verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? Think. If you're afraid, you're not thinking. Are you worried? Are you worried about the future? Are you worried about retirement? Are you worried about you're not going to have enough to do this or that? Are you worried? Are you worried? Paul says, and you're not thinking. You're not thinking. In verse 32, he said, don't forget, he didn't spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us. How will he not now with him freely give us all things? Are you worried about things you you think you're going to need that you're not going to have? God has said, I'm going to meet your needs as my child. You're part of my family. Are you worried? Then you're not thinking. You're feeling you're not thinking, you're, you're operating on emotion. You're not thinking. Are you feeling guilty? Now understand, there's, there's true guilt. And, and there's a sense in which if you have sinned, you ought to feel some guilt. Even as a believer. But when you confess that and deal with that before God, you, you ought not feel guilty. We, we dealt... Sunday night, oh, excuse me, Wednesday night in our, in our theology study, we're talking about the, the theology of, of revival, because that's a word that's so misunderstood, and we talked about when real revival comes, there'll be confession, and, and that confession has three different levels. If, if, it's, if it's a sin in private, then it ought to be confessed to God and dealt with there and let it, let it be done. If it's a sin against another person, then there's two steps to it. You ought to go to that person well, you ought to deal with it with God first. And then you ought to go to that person and you ought to seek forgiveness. You ought to seek reconciliation. You ought to ask for their forgiveness. And if someone comes to you that sinned against you and asks for your forgiveness, you ought to grant that forgiveness. That, that's a part of real confession, genuine confession. So if it's, if it's between you and another person, there's a second step. And, and then if it's a public sin, then the Scripture says if it's a public sin then by God's grace, you ought to find the grace to be able to confess it publicly. If you've got sin and it's known all over town and, and everybody in church knows about it and nobody's talking about it and everybody's kind of uh, whispering about it behind your back, then you need to go and say, listen, that is sin and God has dealt with me about it and I want to ask your forgiveness. I've already sought his forgiveness. I had a staff member one time in Stone Mountain, Georgia, had to do that. Because his sin became public, and it was no way that he could just say, well, me and God have dealt with it, and me and my wife have dealt with it, and, and that's all we have to do. No, it was public. He had to go before the church and say, listen, my sin is, is this. And he had to specifically say what it was, and it was adultery. And he had to step down from his ministry. 
And, and he had to go through reconciliation with his wife and reconciliation with the body. And, and he had to go through restoration. And, 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 but he, was, he, he couldn't have a public ministry because his sin became, it was a public sin. So there, there are things that happen, but, and, and they will, there will be real guilt there at times that even a believer has to seek God's face on. And confess, not confess to get forgiveness for it. You're justified, according to Scripture. But seek God's grace of forgiveness for your cleansing and for your own good and your own walk. You're feeling guilty and you've dealt with it before God and you've dealt with it with other people that needs to be dealt with then. Then if you're still feeling guilty, you're not thinking. You're not thinking the thoughts of God. You're not thinking about the truth of God in your life. Listen, folks. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. Well, I've always told you, here, think. Keep that as the second thing. You think about what God has said, and then you realize that these are not dry doctrines. This is not some kind of academic exercise. These are life. These are life in Christ. These are life in union with Christ. And these are life-changing, life-revolutionizing truths that every one of us who are in Christ need to recognize and need to know. If you're not living with an overwhelming assurance and power in Christ, then you've not fully understood them. If you're not living with an assurance that you belong to Him, not because of what you have done, but because of what He has done in your life, if you're not living with an assurance that com- and, a, and a power that comes from that insurance, assurance of being able to speak the truth of God when the circumstances call for it, then you've not understood the great truths of being in Christ. This is life. And this is life changing. And I challenge you think. When you're afraid, think. When you're worried, think. When you're feeling guilty, think. Go before Him. Seek His assurance. Because it says His Spirit will bear witness with our spirit. That we belong to Him. So often we just let our emotions rule us, don't we? So often we just let our feelings run rampant. And listen, there's some days I don't feel like standing right here. Some days I don't feel like loving my wife. Some days I don't feel like getting out of bed, but I have to do it. In all cases, because I can't let my life be based on feelings. I have to be based on truth. The truth of God's Word applied to our lives. Let's pray together. His grace is greater than our sin. We sang about that. When God begins a good work in our life, He will perfect it. We sang about that. Why would we fear men and circumstances when we know the God of angel armies is our Father and our protector? We sang about that. We know that his name is to be blessed above all blessed above all names. Because he is a sovereign God of all creation, of all things. And we are in him. Mm. We are in union with him. And it's his grace and his mercy.
changes our lives. We are a debtor to mercy alone. Father, as we bow in your presence, needing your truth to permeate our lives. Needing, Lord, for facts, the facts of the gospel to permeate our lives. To give us right thinking that will cause us to fall before you and confess when we fail you, yes. But to know that nothing can separate us from your love, nothing can separate us from what you have given us in Christ, you are there, you are steady, you are faithful even when we're not. Father, Do your work in lives this morning for salvation, for renewal. Change us, shape us as individuals and as a body into the image of Christ. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.